Hi everyone. So we talk a lot on the channel about a concept called embodiment, but we don't always explain exactly what we mean when we're saying that. And it's become a really important concept for us because embodiment is our ability to stay connected to our bodies, really simply, and to our senses, and to be able to be kind of um, awake to what's happening around us. But one of the reasons that's so important right now is that our environment is constantly trying to pull our attention away from ourselves. And Tristan Harris, in fact, has said that we're living in an attention economy. So our attention is incredibly valuable, but it's most valuable to us because we need to um, be able to direct our attention uh, where we want to, to be able to make sense, to be able to pursue our goals, to feel connected to the world. And so we've been talking about this a lot and exploring this a lot through lots of different practices. And now we've decided to create a new online course, which is called Embodiment and Flow, and very much focused on, okay, well, what are the practices and the techniques that we need to get into that space of embodiment? So I think one of the best frameworks for talking about this is John Bavakey's work, where he talks about the different levels of knowing, propositional being the sort of the one that we are most familiar with, the, the sort of knowing that kind of conceptual, but there are three other layers of knowing that are much more embodied, much more about kind of where we are and who we are in the world. And John's work is so fantastic because it also taps into the cutting edge of cognitive science and explains that. And mainly from his work, there's been a lot of focus recently on the idea of the ecology of practice. What are the practices that we need? And I find that that's a really useful framework. And it's one that I'm starting to see everywhere. It's sort of like almost like a new buzzword, ecology of practice. Because contained in it is the idea that it's not just about one practice. It's not just like learning mindfulness and that being like a panacea or any other kind of yoga and that just being the only thing that you need. It's the idea that different practices give us different skills. And what are the practices that we need? So we're going to start the very first session of the course with John Verveke because his framing is, is actually kind of somewhat revolutionary, incredibly useful for understanding these embodiment practices in a, in a new way and linking together practice and theory in a way that I, I don't think has, has really been done before. So here's, here's John talking a bit about what embodiment is. Embodiment matters because we're going through a huge uh, transition in cognitive science, which will eventually percolate out um, of understanding that the body isn't just a vehicle or something shaped by cognition, um, that the body is actually crucial, uh, deeply crucial to, to, to cognition. You think through the body in both senses of the word. Um, and, um, and that a lot of that kind of cognition that's taking place in that embodied fashion is actually central to uh, the way in which people do things that make their lives uh, meaningful and important, um, um, lives that they want to belong to, uh, help with the cultivation of wisdom. Um, so just to give one easy but clear example, um, and this goes to work done by Barbara Tversky and other people, um, the way you, you move your body through physical space and navigate it, that's exapted and used by how you move through conceptual space. And notice that I'm doing this thing with my hands to try and lend extra intelligibility to this very abstract thing I'm saying. But So basically the way you move around conceptual space or logical space is, right, you're basically taking the same machinery you use for moving around physical space and you're exapting it. And so, um, and this shows up in, in a lot of work around, you know, um, conceptual metaphor and things like that. So um, the fact that um, you want to balance equations or balance the scales of justice, you're using an, a term from embodiment where you're the cerebellar cortex loop where you actually, and this is something that I know a lot about because of Meniere's, right? So I'm more aware because I have to be of how, of all the intricate dynamics of physical balancing. And because of Tai Chi practice, I've also become aware, people have pointed out to me how that training of physical balance has, got, has been taken up into more, a more balanced way of, of dialoguing with people, of problem solving, etc. Yeah, and so I've been, so I'm in the middle of making a documentary about John's work, because I think he's probably one of the most exciting thinkers that we featured and there's something, so I've been thinking a lot about his, his work. 
And one of the ways of seeing it, I think one of one of the ways is seeing him as a sort of deeper resolution of some of the philosophical questions that have been raised in a much more intellectual way, because his work really points towards the body and it points towards practice and the need for practice and not only solving things at the kind of the propositional level, but bringing in all the other levels of kind of awareness and knowing. And I think a really nice example of a healthy marriage between practice and theory uh, comes through Rafe Kelly. And so Rafe is a real pioneer in parkour, one of the kind of key players in, in the early parkour movement. And now he runs a kind of um, consultancy called Evolve Move Play. Uh, and he is um, really taking a lot of John Verveke's framing and, and marrying it together with movement and explaining why movement is so important for, for our cognition as a whole. And so Rafe, in, that, in the very first session we're doing, um, is going to build off of John's framing and introduce a movement diet that you can use throughout the course. So a way that you can start, well, moving more is one aspect of it, but actually moving a lot more consciously and, and starting to see your environment in a different way. So here's Rafe talking about his work. Fundamentally, I believe that for, for optimal self-cultivation, we have to recognize that um, our experience of being starts in being in, in a body and that the types of bodies that we have are bodies that move. And they move to fulfill their fundamental functions. And within movement, we, we are integrating all of the different aspects of ourselves from the cognitive to the emotional to the physical to even you might consider the spiritual. All of those things come together in order to be able to help us accomplish and solve the problems in our lives, which we do through movement. Um, in fact, if we look at the, 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 the genealogy of, of thinking, what you see is that we think in some sense to, uh, to abstract movement patterns so that we don't have to try all of them out and fail at them. Right. Uh, Alfred White North had famously said, we think so that our thoughts may die and not us. But what we do when we're thinking is mostly modeling motor patterns that we could express in the world and seeing if they would lead us towards goals that are relevant to us. Um, the problem is that when we just do the, the, the thinking and it doesn't land in the body and in action, um, we can get into an infinite recursion. Um, and it doesn't actually lead us towards uh, self-cultivation and self-growth. So we think that movement is the most profound and powerful practice to start with. And we know now that like you can't out-supplement a, a bad diet, right? No amount of food products can replace having a whole food-based diet. And we believe that the same thing is basically true of movement, that you need to move in the ways that your body evolved to move and that it traditionally moved for hundreds and thousands of years. Um in order to nourish your tissues, but not just your tissues, your, your psyche, your emotional uh, uh, connections with people, right? If you want to get a group of people to feel deeply bonded together and to really experience community, it's gonna happen so much faster if you have them singing and dancing together, right? So what are the, the fundamental nutrients that we have always needed? Well. Human beings evolved walking, you know, five, 10 miles a day all the time. So you need to walk, right? And we can see this physiologically that you need to walk um, because your lymph system, which is the sewage system of your body is pumped by the muscle action of your walking, particularly by your heel striking the ground. So when we see these traditional things that have been important in every culture in the world, like getting together in a group and dancing, like, oh, it's cardio. So, well, yes. <laughs> It's a lot more, more than cardio. So what we're trying to do is essentially identify those fundamentals that we absolutely need and how we can get enough of them. And in the same way that Rafe Kelly is providing a kind of toolkit of different practices that you can choose to use throughout the course, we also have Dr. Shama Raman doing the same thing. So Shama is a neuroscientist and a pretty accomplished musician. And her research and her kind of PhD research is in the neuroscience of flow and creativity. So she's going to be presenting um, a, a lot of different practices that you can use throughout to bring more flow into your life and also to, um, to enhance your creativity. And those two things are, are, as you will see, really closely linked together. So here's Shama talking about her work. Hi, I'm Dr. Shama Rahman, and I'm an artist, and I'm also a neuroscientist in creativity research. 
Um, as such, in my PhD research, I ex essentially examined the brain uh, and looked at different sort of brain activity that characterizes the different stages of creativity. Um, and within one of these stages is the state of flow. Um, so this is characterized by high creativity, which uh, in neurocognitive speak is actually translated to cognitive flexibility. And this is the ability to, to essentially find lots of different um, solutions to a problem that you might have. So this actually leads to mental resilience, to stress. And uh, in addition to that, you have things like having heightened attention, heightened sort of uh, intrinsic motivation. You're able to look at the sort of little details in the bigger picture at the same time. And all of this leads to higher performance, leads to higher engagement, higher collaboration, and of course, um, in general, performance. So this is how creativity is linked to the flow state. I'm particularly uh, interested in embodiment as is related to the integration of multiple sort of senses that you have and also multiple cognitive uh, abilities that you have. So that is to do with motor, uh, is to do with sort of um, uh, sound, sight, touch, um, and the ability to essentially integrate um, your emotions, your motor cortex, your decision making. Um, and often this can happen in, in, in the form of being totally aware and present, um, having that sort of increased sense of uh, awareness not only of yourself, but of also your settings, your environment, your surroundings in general, and, and the people that you're collaborating with. So I'm a firm believer in uh, collaboration actually leading to higher sort of states of flow or even enabling them faster. And so one of the sessions will be with Nicola Price, who is a fabulous breathwork teacher. And I've spent a lot of time doing different types of breathwork. And I would say that Nicola is as good as anyone I've, I've worked with. She's really intuitive. She's very eccentric. She's like this kind of wonderful eccentric English type. Um, and she really brings in not only breath work, she's very intuitive with breath work, but she also brings in other types of movement as well, like dance and, and connection and, and, and really sort of loosening up the body. So most people have no observation typically of their breath. They've got no idea really what's happening and they they typically come to breath work and then realize, they say things like, I've realized I'm holding my breath a lot, or I've realized how, shallow how, how much I'm shallow breathing. So why is it important to have a good relationship with your breath? Just bringing your conscious awareness to what's going on is, is so interesting actually, especially if you think about it, now it's quite an emotional time with COVID and there's lots going on. We have a war. And the first thing to go when we're emotional is our breath. The first thing to shift and change is our breath. So my experience is that most people have a dysfunctional breath in one way or another. It's absolutely fascinating when we take the breath apart. We take the inhale, the exhale, the pausing all apart and then analyze and look at each part of that and then we put it all back together again and we look at the ergonomics we look at the purring engine of a breath how a baby breathes so a baby breathes in in a very distinctive 360 degree breath and everybody has a unique breathing pattern every single person that I've looked at I've been able to tweak or shift and change whether it's the musculature, they're using the wrong muscles to breathe. And that's a really, the wonderful thing about this is it's really easy to rectify, but it needs to be pointed out. It's not something that people typically notice themselves. Inspirational breathing is just a methodology that I created and voraciously reading and learning about all aspects of the breath and the tools around the breath that we can use. So the breath is a little bit like a Swiss army knife. There are different blades. So I know James Nestor just written this wonderful book called Breath and we've got Wim Hof. And so we've got various different types of ideas around the breath. Inspirational breathing is a conscious connected breath where it's really simple. We breathe in for a count of two and then exhale for a count of one. And we, we take the breath back to our baby's breath. It's how the breath was designed. So we're not manipulating it. We're, we're looking at how we breathe fully functioning and, and then we take it up a notch. So we use that purring engine of a breath 
and then just getting on Maserati. <laughs> or like me, uh, uh, my Honda Rebel 500 motorbike, and it's like, <laughs> and then we're off. Um, so we, yeah, we, we develop this really simple knowing of what we need, what our breath needs to look like and feel like as a fully functioning breath. And then we've got a session with our good friend, Roger Jackson, who is a really talented somatic experiencing coach, really deeply embodied, really understands Peter Levine's work and that whole kind of tradition of, which was something that kind of revolutionized the embodiment world, I would say, in the kind of 90s. Yeah, in the 90s. So we've talked about this quite a bit on the channel before. Stephen Porges created something called polyvagal theory, and that really dovetailed and aligned with what Peter Levine, who invented somatic experiencing, was, was developing in his practice, which was much more kind of therapy-based, intuitive understanding of trauma, and through that, an understanding of really how the body integrates experience, how the body struggles to integrate certain experiences. And yeah, Roger is so sort of deeply attuned to that and really in tune with that kind of work. Somatic experiencing and flow are related in the sense that what we're looking for with somatic experiencing is to find places where people have got stuck. Trauma is about getting stuck. So it might be that we, we went through a situation that shocked us so much that we keep rethinking it, reliving it, redreaming it. We, we haven't worked out why it happened to us and what we would do next time if it was to happen to us again. And so our body is still running through the same process of fear. So whether that's a fight flight response or a freeze response. So that with the fight flight response, you know, we're going to be constantly anxious, constantly prepared either to either to battle or to run as fast as we can. But because we're not sure when it's going to happen and because we weren't able to resolve it the first time, there's often a component of the freeze response. And so there's, there's a part of us that we wanted to react and yet we couldn't react. So for some reason, physiologically, something is stuck in, in our story. Something is stuck that we haven't that we can't get over. So we're looking, how do we complete that? How do we give it closure and how do we allow the body to come back to something which is flowing again? So as we start to release all of these small T traumas and capital T big traumas, slowly the experience is we start to get back in contact with our natural rhythms, which is when we need to activate our system and mobilize, that we have energy and we feel powerful. And so we can work and we can play and we can do. And then after we've worked and played and done and mobilized and then we start to relax and we maybe eat some food and we hang out with some friends and we're nice and relaxed and, and we digest and we have a sleep. And so what we're really looking for is a healthy nervous system which mobilizes well and then immobilizes well. So it's sympathetic and parasympathetic, up and down. So then we have Skylar Brown, who is, I think, becoming, getting a lot more profile recently and, and quite rightly, because I think she is bringing something that feels really new, which is what we're going to be exploring, which is cultural embodiment. How, how does this embodiment feel? How does this sense of kind of feeling into our embodied experience affect the way that we look at culture and how we respond to things? And this, I think, is a really interesting new edge for the conversation. So cultural embodiment arose um, as an experiment. It was um, a collaborative brainstorm that I was having with Peter Lindbergh at the STOA. And uh, he was just getting excited about the possibilities of embodiment. And um, we came up with this idea of processing the culture through the body. Um, and this is like, it was so obvious to me and it's a beautiful synthesis of a couple of different parts of my life and my life experience. I was in advertising for 15 years. Um, I was a futurist trend spotter, like basically a culture maven. So I have this natural, like even then I had this natural affinity and, um, and like a, a radar, like I have a very fine tuned um, antenna for what's happening in the culture. 
And, uh, but I, I rejected it because it's so, um, it's so empty, you know, the media is like such a problem. And so I kind of walked away from it and got really embodied and like yoga and, you know, just like dance and, um, meditation and, 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 you know, it's like, I rejected the media and the world of advertising and the way the media manipulates. Um, and so when I began to offer this cultural embodiment practice, I was like, oh, wow, this is the integration I was needing. It's the, it's a synthesis. It's an integration, um, and a turning back towards the media that we're creating as a reflection of where we're at. You know, it's like so many people I know, especially people in like a spiritual community or, you know, it's like um, there's oftentimes a turning away from the media. And what I'm offering is a way of turning back towards it to really process and face what it is we're creating. Like, you know, and when I say we, I mean, we as human, you know, like the one human organism, like humanity. Um, and so over, you know, every week um, we process a piece of media or culture that's like buzzy or has some kind of, it's like hitting some kind of cultural nerve. So it could be the Will Smith slap, or um, we've done some work on the war in Ukraine, and we've done some work on here in the U.S. Fox News and um, Tucker Carlson's The End of Men. It's like these little flashpoints that tell us something about how we're doing, like where we're at. Um, so, and the idea is not to uh, talk about it, or um, we're, we're trying to avoid opinions, judgments, and perspectives of the mind and go deep into the body and really work with the feelings that the piece generates. And then last but definitely not least is Tom Morley. So Tom is going to do a session around rhythm and he's kind of the perfect person to do that because Tom is uh, a kind of movement and rhythm facilitator. Uh, he uses a lot of drumming and he does workshops all around the world. We've actually worked with him quite a few times in person and online. But he also has a background as, as a pop star, basically. He was the drummer in a band called Scritti Politti, who were really um, quite, quite well known for, for being sort of at the peak of improvisational music. And you know, he's worked with lots of different pop stars doing that. And so Tom's really has that experience of being in a big space of group flow. And he's brought that into what he does now. And so in this final session, which is called Rhythm, we're going to be getting through, through the... Um, yeah, through rhythm, we're going to be getting into a, a space of group flow together. And that really kind of brings together all the different practices we will have been exploring on the course. So here's Tom talking about his work. And I'm going to show you what the energy of the music business is like, that rock star energy, the energy you see people bring out on stage, even when they've been on tour for a month, and they're absolutely knackered, you know, when they get on stage, it, it comes. So that kind of rock star energy is um i mean it's my work's really based on the work uh of me high chick sent me high and his book flow where he says flow is found at the intersection of discipline and surrender i say the groove is found at the crossroads of discipline and surrender and mischief speak So embodiment and flow is really designed to help you identify your own embodiment and flow needs and, and then start applying them into your life straight away. So in one sense, everyone is going to have a slightly different experience on the course because you'll, you know, it might be that you want to move more. It might be that you want to develop your own breathwork practice or that you want to become more mindful. So you'll have the option to really go in your own journey. But like all of our courses, this is a shared journey. And that's one of the most powerful things, I think, about a process like this. So we'll all be together and we'll also be um, setting up uh, ways that you can meet others and, you know, from around the world. Usually we have, you know, people from up to 50 countries on the courses. 
um, and to really, um, yeah, support one another in, in deepening your, your sense of embodiment, bringing more flow and creativity into your life. So if it sounds like something you would like to do, we'd love to see you there and you can find out more information down in the show notes.